Hi, thanks for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Artcast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together and talk about various things that bubble up in one's mind when one takes on this endeavor of communicating visually. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... Hey, Jersey. I am Rob Stenzinger, a user experience and game designer. Good to see you again, Rob. Good to see you again, too. Had a couple of breaks this month. Uh, it's been a crazy August. Did some uh, rebroadcasts, but we're back with another live episode. Um, anything that we should catch up on before we're diving into uh, the topic? Oh, gosh. I don't know if... Uh, hold on. I'm checking for shucking. I'm checking for jiving. I don't know. I'm just good with our topic. We can, yeah. we can jump right in. We just, we just dive in, whittling. Mm -hmm. A topic that's come up on the show before. In fact... Uh, whittling. What do we mean by whittling? I'll pull up some episodes that we, we talked about before. If you want to mm -hmm. maybe take the take the baton and, and define what we mean by that. Yeah, I mean it's it, well, it's a uh, it's a metaphor that I think is really handy. I, part of me wants to to be all mm, self deprecative and say, oh, it's a, it's it's an abused metaphor. I I don't think I I feel like we've treated it pretty well. Where uh, a, a an actual whittler probably would be like, yeah, you know, fair enough use of my hobby as a metaphor. Because the idea is, uh, you know, with whittling, you've you've got um, like some small piece of wood that you can work on. It's pocket, it's pocketable, and that that the the work is pocketable, and so is the like so are the tools and everything, and and you just um, you can switch into that mode pretty quickly and easily, and um, and just sort of work away at something. And so uh, when we talk about that for um well other work it's uh it's it has similar qualities you can pick it up you can put it down and that's a that's a whittable whittleable project and especially if you could probably you know do something useful in a smallish bit of time and as opposed to we did an episode not long ago on um creative marathons and this is different than a creative marathon because it's something where why, why do you laugh <laughs> no yeah I mean, that's a good a good contrast uh yeah a mar if if it's a if it's a project that requires a marathon a, a long sustained uninterrupted session then that's um you, you know if it is a whittleable project you're <laughs> that's a lot of whittling <laughs> <laughs> right yeah it, it's something where i think an important framework to think about what we mean by whittling when it comes to projects is the accumulation of effort will not be immediately apparent hmm. whereas with a um a creative marathon you expect to get a noticeable chunk of effort behind you right so um this is i think it's related to what brandon dayton calls the monastic way of art the, the monastic uh approach to art which is to say you you just check in because you check in. You're not doing it for any specific goal. It's it's more of a lifestyle or a habit. Again, related to, but not quite the same thing. Because when we talk about whittling, we are also talking about there is some uh, accumulation of effort that occurs, but it's just not as immediate. And um, uh, it's something that comes down the road after numerous check ins. Yeah, especially d depending on the kind of project you're working on. If you have a project that has many stages of, of effort, uh, and and you put in, you put in the logistical effort to make that, you know, possible to whittle on. It, it's yeah, you're not going to see a lot of, a lot of that output that you're really doing the whole thing for. Probably, um, not not in the in like a a few minutes here and there. And so. yeah, so so that's what we're going to talk about today. That's what we're going to like kick around a little bit and look at and, and examine a few different kinds of whittling that we both do with our projects and see if it uh, connects with any of you guys who are listening and watching. Uh, those who are showing up live, feel free to comment in the chat and you can always comment on the post after the fact and we'll follow up with you at patreon.com slash lean into art. So mm -hmm. with that, Rob, are you ready to hit the music to go to the next part? I, I just do want to shout out or call out to our a couple of the past efforts we we put into the topic whittling. Right? Oh, just, I was going to put that on the other side of our music. Other side. Oh, other side of the music. All right, everyone's got to wait. <laughs> <laughs> but it'll be worth the wait. <laughs> 
Because you had to have a dance break. <laughs> That's not like a part of the show, isn't it? Uh, it is now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, All right. yes, uh, you want if you want to call out a couple episodes, I'll pull them up on screen so people can see what they're looking okay. for. Uh, so this is it, I mean, it's something that that's come up on the Lean Into Artcast with uh, we, we talked about sustainable side hustle and that uh, the concept of whittling fits very well with with this where okay, you have your main projects, but then you've got these other things that uh, you're, you're chipping away at, making some kind of progress and sustainable. And whittling, I think, can go well hand in hand. Makes sense that we talked about it in mm -hmm. episode 207 of the, the Lean Into Art cast. Um, and then we did talk about it on a couple of extra leans as well. Um, <laughs> and extra lean is, you know, the titles uh, sometimes really put the um, really straightforward, uh, straight in a straightforward manner, hit the point, like uh, slow whittling projects. And I think we're mm -hmm. doing a little bit of lamenting on like, well, whittling takes a long time. <laughs> Fair enough. That happens. Uh, and then that was extra lean 36. And then in extra lean 69, we talked about being meaner to the whittlers next time. <laughs> And I, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to find that episode. I couldn't dig it up in the in the Patreon archive, but mm -hmm. I will find it because I want to find out why we wanted to be meaner to the Whittlers. <laughs> uh, and then I've, uh, it's, I can't put this concept down because inherently, um, I mean, during much of, uh, I mean, my time with this project with you, Jersey, Lean Into Art, I've I've had. Uh, different size, other professional commitments during, you know, during this, you know, whatever, seven years or so we've been, we've been making this, oh, I think seven years yeah. this month. Holy cow. Yeah. Happy anniversary. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, it, so anyway, it comes up a lot. So I've, I've mentioned this on a couple of, uh, Polytechnicast episodes as well. Um, and, uh. <laughs> Two, and what's funny is that I was searching. I found two that I published and one that I didn't publish. Mm. <laughs> um, it, the, which has come up from time to time where I've, I've, um, I, exper I, I did some experiments with, you know, making the Polytechnicast more frequent and in a sustainable manner. And um, not, I just didn't like all those takes. Some of them, you know, due to audio quality, some of them due to just, you know, recording myself while driving. And being like, well, I really didn't like what just happened there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, and anything from like, wow, someone right next to my car honked their horn super loud. Do I want to publish that as a podcast? I don't know. Anyway, um, yeah, but, but it comes up. It's on, it's, this is a topic not far from top of mind for me. Uh, and so, yeah, one of the episodes I see Jersey has up is um, a Turbo Graphics Cameo with uh, game design workshop note cards. And uh, that's, uh, th that's a, a common situation I find myself in where uh, I love to com you know, make some kind of commitment to um, a, a side project that I care about. And especially if it has a deadline, it puts me in a situation where I better figure out a way to make consistent um, progress, nibbling away at it, right? And mm -hmm. so, yeah, workshops. That's uh, that's one that gets me whittling. And then there was Polytechnicast uh, Art Sound of 2015, Day 17, Adventures in Network Time. <laughs> yeah, and that, uh, gosh, those, those, yeah, Art Sound off from, yeah, almost three years ago. Lord. And that, uh, yeah, I think I, what, what networking event did I go to? I'm, yeah, I'm forgetting, but uh, again, it's, it's always top of mind whittling it's uh it's i don't know i feel like it if there were some kind of drinking game related to you know podcasting uh this would be one of those like sleeper topics that would deserve <laughs> some kind of event yeah well because i think it's it's i think it's for at least for us well, i don't want to speak for anybody else but um it's integral to the way we we get anything done um because many 
my comics projects, I'm working on a couple different projects at the same time, right? Or there's some overlap. I'm finishing one as I'm starting up another. Um, and then there's other hustles that I'm doing, like teaching and like the summer traveling for a book tour. Mm -hmm. So uninterrupted blocks of time get f fewer and farther between. So those whittling sessions become uh, essential to making any headway with the project. So I guess we can we can just dive in and start talking about that. Yeah, like what yeah. does what yeah, does it look what like? does it look like for you or for each of us? Yeah, let's start with you. Oh, okay. Um, I think um, I started to mention the uh, like working on um, working on workshops is is definitely a, a, a big one. That um, so yeah, 2018. That's you know a couple of recent examples. Uh, working on uh, the new version of an existing workshop, which it helps having some, some material from before. I mean, that's, that is a, that's a nice situation for whittling because you have so much pre, um, pre prepared, uh, material to work with. Right. And, and, uh, so now whittling looks more like refinement instead of just establishing and, uh, getting some, something else, something out there. So, um, I also had, uh, feedback because this was road tested. It wasn't just like, oh, I had this on the shelf and never, you know, put it in front of an audience. I had data and um, notes that I, <laughs> thankfully, I captured and was able to dig out with uh, with this fresh version. And um, then then uh, there's an approach I think I stole from you, Jersey, when when uh, when I do workshops, uh, and I and I. You know, this happens when I'm whether I'm refining one that exists already or, or working on something new. I like to get it to a rough draft stage and then record myself performing it. Oh, yeah. And yeah. then I, I have it in my pocket and I can uh, get fr my own fresh reactions to, oh, this is this t this section's too long. Uh, this section I did not. Um, I, ha I, I missed an opportunity to reinforce a point from a different angle um to to try to um you know make something more solid for more learning styles and the reason being yeah. is that when you're listening to yourself you can focus on what you're actually saying rather than trying to remember what you need to say next like when you're actually doing a performance oh. there's like this little bit about thinking about three seconds ahead while also thinking about what's happening now so yes uh i probably picked that up from somebody else too but like yes listening to yourself as an audience uh oh my gosh that's been so helpful to refine my talks and presentations well, I, yeah, I love that. So, I mean, you mentioned it, I think, a while back in a Thunder Punch Daily. I, I wonder, Did it really? Yeah. Oh, funny. Pretty darn sure. <laughs> I believe you. I believe you. Yeah. Just, you know, you you would know better than I would because uh, I, I, I record those and then, like, walk away from them. I probably should go back and revisit them sometime. <laughs> I Yeah, I think you should. I think there's... Uh, um, there is a rich set of material to mine and in both from, from, I mean, it's another form of journaling, but like putting yeah. all that stuff behind you and then, then being able to dig through it. Uh, yeah. and especially when it's so, um, I don't know what to say. Like there's so much density of data in something that has the, an intentional performance for service. I think, Maybe there's some cruft. Maybe there's some wrapping and trappings and, and sectioning, mm -hmm. right? But like, it's not as much of a meandering where you're like, yeah, needing to it doesn't mine. have time for it. Yeah, I mean, like the, the longest episodes are twenty minutes. Um, and for those who don't know, if you, if you're just tuning into the show now, um, Thunder Punch Daily is a journal microcast that I started way back in what 2010. Um, mm. and these days, I only check in on it once one month out of the year during Art Sound Off, and I do 30 episodes uh, in that month. Um, so I forget how many episodes there are, but like it's 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 a catalog of my thoughts on making comics going all the way back to 2010. So there's probably some interesting ideas that I probably wouldn't agree with anymore, but that, that would be part of the fun thing of, of exploring it again. But that you can find that at comicsagreat.com. Well, I'll link to it in the show notes, but okay. Oh, that's great. It's uh, it's a trove and, and lots of awesome stuff there. Um, yes, it's a great place to learn about um, what would it 
what could it look like if I did a journal podcast? So, mm. Yeah. Fantastic resource. Um, yeah. So okay. The, so workshops, workshops yeah, is whittling workshops is... and that that technique taken from from you a while back. Uh, and what what else was I was I doing to make that whittleable? I went. Um, let's see. I went with a a paper approach later in the process where uh, it wasn't about um, re, you know refining an electronic deck. I did an electronic deck as a um, <laughs> only as a tool to create physical cards, and then I did merciless editing later on, when, like when it was in that form, um, fairly well chunked logical, you know, like each each um each slide or or you know piece of paper as it ended up um because i printed it uh eight and a half by 11 standard you know u.s letter but then uh it was four um four of the slides per page chopped it all up what and then i just kept when i practiced with it later on um i was able to uh continue the whittling not quite like little paring knife in a, in a hunk of wood but take a piece of paper paper and it's done it's out of the deck right mm -hmm. literally physically out of the deck and that uh that was that was a really handy way to to keep at it and keep um and keep refining it and see how it was becoming more and more focused as the as the little stack of cards got shorter uh yeah so there was some like immediate visual feedback as you were working on that part of it mm-hmm but I'm I'm hearing in the beginning that you started digitally, um, and and I want to go back to your original metaphor you threw out at the top of the episode with this idea of something that's pocketable. Was part of the reason that you started with a digital deck also because of the mobility of working that way? It it's sort of a tool optimization um, because what I how I did that was um, I, I I worked in Markdown as you know which is a text format that lets you have a, a, a structured document with a, not a lot of um, um extra gunk right so it's not it's not stuck in a rich text editor's world it's in markdown which means it's in a, it's in plain text which i can use any sorts of any sort of tool to edit it which was very portable so i could edit it on my phone and and it's not going to be looking weird or different on different you know, other devices. Um, but then, uh, what is that? Uh, there's an app that I use called deck set and I have an older version of it, um, which, uh, I haven't upgraded, but, uh, yeah, deck set can transform a markdown file into a slide deck. And that was just a, uh, like a handy leap. So I went from markdown to deck set to like, so now it's a PDF. I printed the PDF for it per page and there you go. So without a lot of um, extra, extra stuff to do in formatting and, and nuances in some app like Google Slides or PowerPoint or Keynote or what have you, um, I went straight from my brain to plain text to rough draft performance, refine the plain text, and then um, turned it into the deck, uh, the physical deck, you know, through those extra couple of steps, and continue to tweak and and uh, and perform it. And I did that same process for the other workshop I did this year, uh, which was brand new, um, designing a branching story quest in Twine. Hmm. So how, how long do these sessions last, these different uh, <laughs> whittling sessions? So what's funny is the whittling sessions, um, they go anywhere from, honestly, 5 to 20 minutes, typically, and then here and there an hour, right? But that's, you know, that's a bit of a luxury. And then I did have a marathon. <laughs> okay. That that let me really push that over. So then, when I was in the stage of I had the deck of, um, I performed. Uh, the, I had the physical deck of cards, and I was able to perform each workshop like four or five times in one day, and just get through those final stages of of editing and, and refinement. 
And mm-hmm. in, the, in the case of the uh, branching story quest and twine, to really um, to finish up the the code project aspect of it. So there's a little bit okay. of coding, and uh, and whatnot with that. Okay, one more question on this: Where did these these whittling events happen? Mm. Uh, a lot of times in my in where I am right now, my my office at home, and then let's see. Sometimes, with downtime here and there, you know, everyone else, it may, maybe I'm hanging out with my family. Everyone's reading a book. I might be tweaking some stuff on my phone, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, in in the past, I have I have tried to make projects compatible with a bus commute, but I've um, you know due to logistics or whatever, have not been commuting by bus as much recently. Mm. So that's, that's another sweet spot is, uh, that, that good old bus commute. (laughs) Any time where you can't really do anything else is like a, a a golden time for that kind of like thing. Right. Uh, cause I find that for me that these sessions happen, um, if I show up to class a little bit early and I'm like, Oh, you know, I set up the room a lot faster than I thought I was going to get it, get it done today. So I've got like 15 minutes. I can get crack a little bit of work on something. Right. Um, or if I'm, I'm waiting for Ann to get out of work or something, you know, like, uh, uh, I, for years, one of the Holy grails for me was what became the Microsoft surface and iPad pro like this going back to the beginning of lean and tart when we were talking about like the galaxy note 10.1, mm-hmm. this idea of if I could take my studio with me in the car and then I could like have a lot more opportunities to put a little work in on projects wherever I am. And, and that's, that's really, I mean, that mobility is really, really key to the way I do it. Um, because my work life is fluid to in such a way as to uh i i can be in a variety of places for a variety of reasons like to 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 be uh better support for my wife but then also to go do workshops and book events all around the uh the state and later on around the country um being able to take that work with me so i don't have to have that art desk um is critical um and that also means that um, you know, I, I find it, I found it was harder in the beginning for me to put in those, those 15 minute sessions, but mm. it's, it's Why almost habitual. If I were to answer as honestly as I can, uh, I would guess that it's partially resistance, partially like, oh, I need to get into the headspace to do a good job of it. Right. Uh, th- th- there's this whole, like, I used to have this whole, this is again, going back about like to 2010, like when I, back when the art and story podcast was still around, I remember talking about like, I have a difficult time working any place other than my art desk. Like I I was talking about sketching at conventions. I found it so terribly difficult because of all of the noise and chatter and, and visual distractions. It was really hard to focus. And I think it was because I had this idea in my head that I had to get into the headspace to do the work. Um, and I found that either through practice uh, or through talking myself out of that, it's that you just do the work whenever you can do the work and it will be reasonably good. Um, obviously, I'm not, I mean, I, I once heard a, a story about Sergio Aragones was able to ink pages of Gru the Wanderer on a train. And I don't know if anybody here watching has ever ridden on a train. When I heard that, my jaw dropped. I was like, no way, nobody can do that. And there's all the bumping and jostling that happens mm. uh but so i don't think i'd be able to do it there but uh you know even like doing a little bit of flatting in a moving car not driving i'm in the passenger side but right like i was i was uh flying a plane home from california this past weekend and uh i was finishing up some penciling on the plane uh thanks to my mobile rig so uh whenever i'm in a situation where i I have nothing else to do. Um, that's a great time to put in like an hour here, half hour there, 15 minutes here and there um, to move so, a little bit forward with stuff. Yeah. So what about the, the? Um, there's a little bit, I mean, multitasking is, I think, mo- mostly debunked at this point. Mm-hmm. But the idea of um, 
having a, a couple of things going on simultaneously ish. Well, so like, what about like watching, you know, watching TV or entertainment or listening to stuff? Of course. Um, yeah. Yeah. So like I'm on the couch watching TV with my wife and that might be a good opportunity if I'm not like thoroughly engrossed in whatever's on the television or if it's something that has like a more uh, dialogue driven narrative so I can just listen to it and I'm not missing out on too much on the screen. Um, then you bet that's a great opportunity to do that. Um, for sure. Hmm. That's not multitasking. That's just listening to something while you're working. Right. And you know, like if I, if I happen to find myself on the phone with a friend for an hour, that's an opportunity to like get a half hour's work to, done on something. Um, depending on the, the kind of work it is, I'm obviously not going to be writing something in that hour. I'm going to be drawing something and usually something that's already been penciled. So I don't have to be doing any problem solving so I can actually be uh, an attentive listener while also getting work done. That is so, that's, um, I, I would like to understand more research about that, how that can even possibly work because um, I understand it and I'm familiar with it. I've, I've experienced it where I can do uh, visual work during, well, I, for instance, I mean, we talked about doing um, like visual note-taking and whatnot. We've chatted about, chatted about that before. And I feel like I'm very engaged with what's going on in the room and what the speaker is doing, even what they're showing. I do look away from time to time to, to do some doodling, but pretty engaged and comprehending uh, as, as, it, as I go. Uh, and somehow that works with some contexts, right? There's a, there's a mismatch sometimes, though, where it's like somehow it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. I, I find that it's very difficult for me to talk on the phone if I'm penciling. Hmm. I mean, if, I, if I'm penciling, I'm doing a lot of visual problem solving. Uh, working out like physicality, anatomy. I'm, I, I feel like I'm doing more quote unquote acting with the characters when I'm doing the penciling. I'm establishing what their body language is, how they're gesturing to one another. What's the exact curl of the lip that they're going to use while they're saying this particular line. Mm. Um, and so like, it, it's much more cognitively engaging when I'm doing that. Whereas when I'm inking, I'm just trying to get the line values right. Uh, and it's, it, it's less load on me. I don't have to inhabit characters to do that. Um, I, would I say that my inking is as good when I'm talking as if I were just listening to something in the background? Um, that that would be something I, I would like to go and look at. I'd love to see some side by side comparisons. I'm I would wager that my line values aren't quite as good when I'm talking on the phone with somebody, but they're probably pretty okay. They're probably passable. I, I mean, I know there are pages of rockets that uh, I was doing some uh, penciling on while talking to people. And I think those pages came out okay. So. Um, and I, this is where I, I would, I, this is all hunch. I have no real clue other than um, chatting with others who, who work visually and, um, and or in different modes where um, like I can actually create words and do writing if I am hearing either music that I'm very familiar with or things that are, that are just instrumental, whatever. But then if it's, mm -hmm. if it's an actual, I can't listen to an audiobook or a podcast. That's a lot of spoken word. If I'm trying to get words out of my head. Right. Yep. And, and but then there's the, the, yeah. So there's the, that match or mismatch, but then I wonder if some of it can become a the skill you build. So a little bit like, I wouldn't be surprised it. if it could be. Yeah. I mean, so, yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised that there there were people who could actually write while a TV is playing in the background. Right? Mm. Practice. I don't yeah, know. I, maybe it would come with uh, with practice, and yeah. uh, and uh, honestly, with uh, with whittling, I feel like I've um, um, I've found depending on the sort of creative output I need to work on, I can set myself up better or worse with uh, with picking up a project. And um, kind of related, where it's a little bit of a skill, a little bit of a habit thing. And I, I um, like worth mentioning um, that we've we've covered this before, but mentioning this panda needs you. It wouldn't have. I, I don't think I would have finished it in the same time frame if I didn't figure out a good way to um, to whittle with it. And and it has. Uh, 
so many aspects to it as, as a project that uh, I was solving new problems, new for me, right? And, and like doing more, um, um, at least one character in the game, having uh, expressive animation that's not just algorithmic. Um, you know, the difference, you know, so doing actual frame by frame animation of the panda, right? That's, um, that was new. Um, there's a, the key algorithm in the game, as far as how the, how you understand if the bricks are, if the blocks are, um, pretty much correct, right? Mm -hmm. And like, having that be ambiguous yet consistent was, uh, that was a challenge, but so it wasn't like just solving rote familiar problems and not all parts of my brain needed to be engaged or whatever. Uh, it's, it's, um, that was totally not the case. And it was also wearing lots of hats too. It wasn't just one kind of task. It was art. It was music. It was all sorts of stuff. And oh, yeah. uh, there was, uh, and one thing that helped me a ton was uh, keeping a journal of that, that project and only that project. And, um, and I would keep, so I, ke I kept two different um, markdown files. One of them, uh, change log dot markdown, right? Dot MD. And uh, the other one being uh, to do dot MD. So this, uh, this helped me chunk things up and, uh, and then remember where in the wide world of sports I left off in this, <laughs> in this beast of a project. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's, that's a big one. I guess we should, maybe we can address that in the second half of the show is this idea of what if the whittling sessions get very, very far apart. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's because then, yeah. And like, like if you, and what if you don't take notes like Rob, what if you don't journal like Rob, what happens then? Um, yeah. Okay. You want, you want to take a break and then we can oh. come back and talk about that. Those sound like wonderful questions and uh, a perfect <laughs> time to, uh, to go from on the ground to. All right. 10, All right. Points. Well, in about a minute and 30 seconds, we will do just that. We'll take on some more, uh, you know, some of the why questions about this stuff and like what, how do we deal with whittling with sessions few and far between. Uh, but before we do that, we got to thank some people, some people who make this show possible. And those people happen to be, uh, folks who support us on Patreon. And let me hit the music so we can actually do the, the break spot. Here we go. Patreon.com slash lean into art is the website. What is it? It's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. And chime in for as little as a dollar a month. And that helps make the show more sustainable. We want to thank five people who've been doing exactly that for us. First up, Shane W. Smith. Thank you, Shane, for believing in us and what we do. You can find Shane on Twitter at Shane underscore W underscore Smith. Also, Ben Odgren. Thank you, Ben, for supporting the show. Uh, you can find Ben on Twitter at Ben Odgren. And Shawnee Redfearn. Thank you, Shawnee, for supporting us. You can find Shawnee on Twitter at Shawnee Redfearn. And Kelly Ishikawa, who is on Twitter as Kelly of Ishikawa. And finally, Becca Hilburn. Becca is on Twitter at Natto Soup. And the reason I bring up these names is because these are people who, you know, believe in us and believe in what we do. You would probably agree with other things that they think, so you can follow them on Twitter. And if you want to join them at patreon.com slash lean into art, you will find all the shows we create, as well as the extra leans, the shows we record just for leaners. I'm trying to scroll to find one right there. There it is. Extra Lean 123 Gentle Bros is the one of the latest ones you can find there, and you'll unlock many, many more you pledge as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash lean into art. We want to thank everybody who's been doing exactly that. It means a lot to us. Thank you so much. There you go. That was, that was well-timed. I, I think I hit the mark. All right. Uh, let's play the music to get to the second part of the show. This is a musical cue so that you know talking about something else. Something serious. Mm. Something ominous. Something looming. Something potentially dreadful. No, it's just us talking about the like we talk about what it looks like when we whittle why do we whittle how do we deal with it uh how do we how do we think about it and how are we thinking about projects in the future like how we would set things up to be whittling that was the title of this episode after all setting up projects for whittling mm. yeah oh well, yeah i mean mm. kind of uh kind of caught me flat-footed um <laughs> because 
I'm like, ooh, does our outline really deliver on that? <laughs> well, I, I, I have something. I have something that actually is along that line. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it actually, it's something I didn't put in the outline because I thought, well, maybe I don't want to talk about it. Maybe I do. Uh, so there's this comic that I wanted to do two years ago for Inktober called Baron Von Bear. And I've been doing some sketches and sharing them on Instagram. Uh, and the, the basic premise is, is like, can I do scary magic stories but with a cute little teddy bear as the main character, right? This, this adorable teddy bear, and he has these adorable little magical helpers. But like the, the, the universe they're navigating is like one of macabre and, and, and you know, and, and myst mystery and, uh, you know, and, and darkness. Um, What's the balance you can strike there? So like that was like the part that was intriguing to me about it. Um, but for various reasons, I never got the thing done. I didn't do it two years ago. Last year, I tried to do uh, a series of rockets drawings for Inktober, fell flat. Um, and so what that means is that here's this character that I've been like kicking around for, you know, more than five years now. Uh, and I don't remember where I left off with it. I, I didn't, I wasn't taking notes. I was just sketching ideas and maybe like jotting down a few sloppy ideas and margins, but I didn't have like a document where I was capturing what the thing was going to be about. Right. There was even like a different cast of characters like six years ago. I had like this guy named Lord Tractorman or something like that. And like this other like lady dinosaur character. <laughs> um, so this long t period of time happens and like, all the ideas, like whatever I had, besides the fact that it was a cute little bear, vanished. It's gone. Forget it. I, I don't know what it, what it was supposed to be. I, all I know is that it was going to be a bear who had like little magical helpers. So what do you do? Right. And so this, this called upon a different kind of whittling where that's where my sketchbook becomes, you know, my opportunity to whittle out ideas and explore uh, what I could potentially do with this thing in a visual way. Right. Um, and it just so happens that I'm trying to train myself how to use watercolor. So I use that as an excuse. OK, I'm going to watercolor something. Well, give me a subject matter. All right. We'll draw this bear doing stuff and see what see what kinds of different images I can I can conjure ranging from, you know, silly ones where it's like, you know, kind of leaning on like the kind of comedy that I like to do. Or if I want to try to get into like actual scary ish stuff. Right. Um. So that's my answer to that question. It's like, what do you do when the sessions are fewer and far between? Is that if you got to start from scratch, start from scratch and do some investigative, uh, you know, like, is, is this, yeah, it's an investigation, right? Me investigating what my mind has to say about it. I, yeah, I think so. I mean, what I was hearing is that, um, it's it's almost like it's using your past work as a way to prime yourself for future work, not as a uh, continuation specifically of past work for um, a final work product of which that past work is a component. It's it's a you're you're reconnecting with it and um, and doing some uh, exploration and generation, right? Mm -hmm. And then. Uh, then I would guess that down the, at some point along your process, there would be a, f uh, a focusing and in, in narrowing of like, oh, this right. is what it's becoming. So this is, this is where we get to something you pointed out in the first half of the show about like having a deadline on the thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like s setting some kind of parameters on it. So I got to thinking, September is around the corner. Um, I just finished teaching some classes. I've got a little bit of extra, I don't want to say extra bandwidth. There's never such thing as extra bandwidth, but I've got time that was allotted to something is now up for grabs for other things. What can I put there? And I thought, what if I use this month as my deadline to write a short story about this character once and for all? So that when Inktober rolls around, I have the thing drafted so I can just jump in and use Inktober as an excuse to ink some percentage of the mini comic uh every day for the month of october shipping it at the end of the month right which i did with a boulder and fleet story a couple years ago uh called a friendly game right um and so then this is another kind of whittling altogether is where i'm like trying to structure the project set it up to where okay you got 30 days to write an 8 to 16 page story right now and then after that you got 30 days to ink it 
which mm -hmm. to make it more manageable and to create discrete chunks that also serve multiple purposes. So I actually feel like that I'm accountable to something. I'm participating in something, which also gives you that little bit of an endorphin kick. I got to use the Inktober hashtag today, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> it is clever. It's, um, uh, okay. There's a, uh, it's not perfect. I've not even read cover to cover this book that I've mentioned a bunch of times, but I've read chunks of it, right? And it's uh, what, it's a whack on the side of the head. Um, totally forgetting the author, but uh, it's one of those things where I've got it on Kindle and I, and I, and I, and I rifle through it for, for ideas and reminders and just even to get refreshed on what I, what I might end up misquoting, but the, the overall structure of this progression of a, cre of a mental model of creativity as having these, these different jobs. And the, and the jobs kind of have a sequence, but they can, they can also be nonlinear. But there is an overall progression toward, um, well, exploring then, and then um, crafting and the artist, right? So it's kind of like if, if each of these was a job, you have the explorer, the artist, the judge and then the warrior, right? And mm -hmm. in a way, what you're describing is you've you've um, prepped yourself to do some focused exploring, right? You didn't just say, um, you know, bear magic, go, right? You said you had this past <laughs> work, and you know it's pretty focused exploring, but it's still um, it's it's not um, it, it's not it's not fully figured out yet. You're like by design, that's what it's being figured out. And then you have the whole, the, the, you know, coming up with the, the new, the, the clever nuance and the, um, the artistic constraints that you're putting on it, exploring the mediums, exploring, um, different things that, uh, so you're doing a little bit of crap, um, explore an artist, but then at some point judge and refine. Um, and then at some point ship, because you know there's a warrior that's all disciplined and whatever warrior like on your art whatever right but it helps it as a stage conceptually get into the world in some disciplined manner and in some ways using a creative challenge is like outsourcing some of the warrior where it's like yeah yeah all right all right community i'm committing to this in public and then getting caught up in that inertia I've, I've been thinking about this a lot ever since like there's been a lot of people talking about um for the last like what eight nine years this idea of how social media plays with our brains like well i'm gonna back up i don't want to say that uh social media interacting with social media tends to trigger certain parts of our brains that like uh are similarly affected by like gambling like the slot machine this time i'm gonna mm -hmm. pull the lever and something good's gonna happen i'm gonna check my mail and this time for sure there's gonna be good news in there um, I'm going to check Twitter this time for sure. Somebody's going to have like, you know, I'm going to check my mentions and something good's going to be in there. Right. And I think about that, like that little endorphin hit of going in and checking something like that. And can we leverage that on ourselves to make us do positive things? Right. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I'm going to check in every day during this art challenge and part of the uh, game I'm playing here is not just trying to ship something so I can ship something, which is itself a reward, but ship something in a way where I can get that daily hit. So I, <laughs> I will have the strength to go back and do it again tomorrow. You know, um, it, it, I know we've said it a lot and I know other people have said it, but I mean, like sometimes this stuff can feel almost like a sickness that like is like you have to trick yourself into going back into it again because it's difficult it's challenging and it's it's uh putting yourself emotionally on the line sometimes um well and even and if it's like, not publicly you're putting yourself through your own series of of judgments where oh gosh yeah i promised myself i would do this yeah does this change what i can think of myself as am i not a whatever uh, right which is yeah do we have to go into this, right? It's like you're not your work, but but yes, yeah. but it's it's hard for us to not uh, identify with that, right? And mm -hmm. yes, you put yourself through all sorts of like terrible judgments when you engage with any kind of creative endeavor. And uh, uh, just one more flavor of judgment because I, <laughs> they're in the, the 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 judges uh, come in many flavors, right? And it's like the they're it's like, like otter pops. There's a green one, a purple one, a blue one. 
<laughs> and, a, and a nasty one that's green and it tastes awful so it's um let's see so w- like one of the judges it's just that um being attached to, to your own ideas and saying like i really want this magic bear to be in the world i love this yeah. bear and yeah. then this yeah that that difficulty of of um just being attached to those those things mm-hmm so so yeah so anyway that's 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 the the structured whittling that i'm i'm considering doing this year uh we'll see if i can get through september and write a script uh or rather like do a thumbnail draft and if i do wind up doing that you can rest assured i'll do it just like how i did a friendly game two years ago uh which is i posted the finished pages to my patreon every day as they were finished i only uh, posted pieces of it on instagram to count as Quite my a good participation. System. I mean, so yeah, I mean, this plan is not unproven. It's uh, a couple of years ago you did it. Yeah, I did do it. And it was a 24 page story. So that one was tough. I'm, this time I'm thinking about setting myself up for success by this time uh, making it a, a smaller story so that, and then I'm actually going to sit down and do the math, right? Like, I'm like, okay, if it's a 16 page story, approximately how much of a page would I have to do every day in order to finish it within the 30 days? Um, if it's an eight page story, approximately how much, like how many panels does that add up to? Um, and then that can also become a constraint to help me write the story to say like, okay, well you can't exceed four panels or five panels per page, right? Because that'll put you over your budget of what you can accomplish in a month. So I don't know. Is, is there anything interesting in there with like, in this terms of like setting up for whittling is to like creating a sense of budget for what you, because like we, we talked in the first half about like, well, it, wherever we find time, I found 15 minutes here, I found 20 minutes there. Uh, is there any value to talking about structuring like little tiny chunks? I Yeah, I think so. I think that's that's part of the, that's one of the creative jobs. That's a, that's a discipline or a role. The the warrior isn't doesn't just show up at the end saying, well, wow, you've got this thing almost done. Just get up get up push it out the door it's like you're talking about intentionally embracing a variety of constraints to help make it likely for this thing to come into existence which is exactly the the job of of that that kind of uh the your project manager brain the 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 you like you're trying to make it more likely for this to exist in the end and be shared and um a real product out in the world Bush and girls in the chat and ask in a way it becomes a speed inking challenge too, doesn't it? Now see, that's, that's the pressure that I'm, I'm trying to wrestle with as I think about how to set this thing up for success is that I don't, the bold and fleet mini comic I did two years ago this way. I feel like it's a good story. It's not as well drawn as I would have, as I would have liked it to have been. As I look at it two years later, I'm like, yeah, there's parts of it that I like, I was really trying to get the page out the door with the hour that I gave myself every day in October to do it. Um, so now I'm trying to figure out, can I do a shorter story to allow more time for the actual art to happen, right? So instead of like an hour to do a whole page, what if I had an hour to do two panels, right? Um, so that I'm still shipping a finished thing, but maybe a little bit of a higher quality thing um, than what I have done in the past. Such a, it, those knobs, adjusting those, those uh the criteria of like okay this is the essence of the project this is the quality that i'm committing to these are the tools i'm committing to this is the time frame committing i like all this um i mean this is what you can do to avoid um like you asked earlier like what if what if you don't uh want to take notes and journal <laughs> that kind of thing well this is right. this is a way to do it to say that well, uh, putting yourself into uh, a purposeful set of other constraints where there's no need to document because the you've, I guess you've eliminated the, the need to document because you've gotten rid of a lot of ambiguity. And mm-hmm. that would mean that for the, the, and including the scope of what you're trying to create, like, this is inherently not a, a, like an R&D project with a ton of, oh, 
um, who knows what's going to come out. You, you're, you should, you're pretty sure there may be some research still happening about what it might be like, but there's not that many variables like in this kind of um, mechanism that you would set up. So yeah, well, if you set up a mechanism like this, you don't need to journal. Uh, and that mission girls following up and the formula and the formula you are sort of creating for the October challenge is one you can use for short term high inspiration projects moving forward. Uh, oh yes, yes, certainly. Uh, and thank you for that feedback actually, because like I, I was just about to respond to Rob with, I have no idea how it sounds to other people, what I just suggested, right? Because as a teacher of young people, I'm used to encountering this notion of waiting for inspiration to happen. And, you know, like the art is something that just flows through you when you are in the right, right state of mind. It's not something that you can compartmentalize and, and uh, organize into a flow chart. Um, and so I, I acknowledge that what I just described may to some people could sound incredibly artificial, right? <laughs> mm, it can. That this is, yeah, this is maybe one of those other um, perennial things that we revisit on the show of uh, art for service or expression. But if you really take it seriously, like this is a job and you have an intention and goals and you wish to bring about this intention into existence, then, um, yeah, I don't know if, if uh, uh I'm having a tough time role playing the other side of that argument <laughs> because I mean, inherently the, 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 I don't know of a project that of, of robust complexity that doesn't have some kind of, um, some kind of intentionality that, that takes structure and is benefited by structure. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I mean, we both have worked in industries where we're shipping things that are going to be consumed, by, hopefully by a lot of people. And in those situations, you can bet there is a lot of structural organization behind that uh, with a lot of different people. So, yeah. Um, and if anything, this is me learning from those experiences and trying to bring it to smaller projects. So allow me to counter this. Okay. And say that um, uh, pfft, mm, mm. part of me wants to just throw down something that uh, inspiration is baloney. Honestly, mm. um, I'm. I, this is my strong opinion, and uh, I wow. I don't, I don't state them. So inspiration is is real, but then using it as an artifice for a mechanism to, through which to create um, is like it's like saying you like. I'm not friendly to people because I'm not in love with everyone or something like that. It's a, it's just, it's a mishmash of <laughs> concepts where, um, so, so, so inspiration is neat when it happens. Um, yeah. but then I would, I would propose that there's a concept that we could, we could focus on that's more constructive. That is capacity. So our skills that we build create capacity, our arrangements that we make, create capacity the the constraints we embrace on a project can create capacity or spend it right and then with practice you can you can find those knobs that are that, that are salient and beneficial and you know work for you right that's uh but but um and then the idea that um to interact with those knobs would only require um the intervention of a one particular emotion or feeling or ideas flowing through your head, then that's that's a capacity thing. Um, I would propose. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, I like that, that word. Over time, through which it's kind of like um, um, it's it, it's a it's a skill you can that that's practicable, and um, that I think there's probably a way for um, people of any any ability to find like, well, what is your, what is your capacity and, and work with that. Right. And, and, a, and a reason I like that word too, is that it, it makes it much more of an individual and, and personal thing to uh, attend to rather than trying to figure out what is the inspirational and speed, uh, the inspirational goal and the uh, artistic speed limit, right? Like, cause like 
something that I, another thing I encounter in my classrooms a lot is this this notion that some kids draw faster than others, right? And to which I try to make it very clear, and and I try try to make it abundantly clear to them is that how quickly you do it uh, is of little interest to me. It's how thoughtfully you do it. And so if it takes you longer, if it takes you less time, that's great. You know, but at whatever speed works best for you. But like, did you do it purposefully and intentionally and thoughtfully? Um, and capacity allows for that kind of flexibility of understanding of speed. Like, well, yeah, I can't draw, I can't ink a page uh, in two hours. You know, only a monster could do that. Well, you don't have to. You just have to find the capacity that you need in order to get that page inked. Right. right. It's it's reasonable and to acknowledge where you're at. It's a, it's it's useful and important. So that that's a constraint to and and your compa your capacity is a constraint to to embrace. Um, and as far as the uh, and let's see, making I I well I I introduce myself as a user experience designer and and user experience is a universal thing. Like your experience matters for what you make. And so what can you set yourself up with to have a, uh, I mean, like what, what points of friction are you dealing with? And of course, this is potentially a distracting path, but like one that you can navigate the tensions of, of um, you know, it's like, you don't, do you need to find the perfect pencil, the perfect desk, the perfect blah, blah, blah. But like, there's somewhere between something being, you know, janky or distracting or broken and perfect and that that works and uh that's uh and, and that's it's 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 something to um to i don't know it's something to explore i'm you know i'm constantly dealing with the tensions of like how well set up am i to do this or that um and it's it's i, I find it worthwhile to consider uh, and try to adjust because my experience matters. Um, I like to notice when someone's doing something where it's like, oh, like listening to a particular um, pleasant background, you know, playlist or whatever, or um, setting up the, the artwork that reminds me of what, you know, why I do what I do and having it nearby. Uh, little stuff like that. Like, that's, that's where I'm like, the, you, the, that's the experience aspect of your experience matters and the things that you can adjust can help you, I think, be closer to that inspired thing. But I think you've, you've probably mitigated inspiration as a roadblock or risk if you've adjust, addressed enough your own experience and your capacity. I think that's great. Gosh, I, I I almost feel like that's like the perfect stopping point to take another break before we do final thought. I don't almost feel that way. I feel that way. <laughs> Look right. at me being all tentative after Rob made such a, a bold and declarative statement on this episode. This one's going to go down in history. This is the one I can do Rob... this. I can make bold statements and still not be a guru. So <laughs> this, These both can be true. Wow, we made a breakthrough today. We really did, at least for me. Oh man! <laughs> All right, uh, you want to take a break and then maybe try to come up with some kind of final thought? Yeah, I think so. There's uh, a lot of interesting open questions that we can just peel back. Okay, grab one. We have that. Also, this is the opportunity for those who show up in the chat. This is for you guys. If you want to hit us with a final thought, final question. For us to to consider for the final thought right there's the advantage to showing up live is that you're the only people who get to do this um so in about another minute and 30 seconds or so we're going to come back with concluding our thoughts on this whole topic of whittling uh, but before we do that we got to thank some other people who make this show possible those people happen to be us we make things and we think about things when we're making things and you know, the, the, the thoughts that make this show are born out of our interactions with the things that we make. So the thing that I would like to talk to you about that uh, I make is a book called Science Comics Rockets, which you can find at sciencecomicsrockets.com. What is it? It is a comics documentary that I made with my wife, Anne. And it is about the history and science of rockets as told by the animals who participated in rocket history. Uh, if you go to sciencecomicsrockets.com, you'll not only find out where we're going to be on tour next, we're going to be at the Carytown Book Fest on September 9th. October, we're going to be at MICE in Cambridge, Massachusetts. You can also find an eight-page preview of Science Comics Rockets here. Uh, I'll pull it up right there. 
look at that. There's uh, Sir Isaac Newton teaching barnyard animals about the laws of motion. Uh, so you actually learn how, like, you know, why rockets go, like what makes them go, like what, you know, unbalanced forces, equal and opposite reactions and how thrust works and how the very first rocket was a wooden pigeon, thousands of years old. Uh, find out more at sciencecomicsrockets.com. And if you do purchase the book, uh, giving us a review on Goodreads would be a really great way to help more people find the book as well, or Amazon for that matter. So, Rob? Hello. You make a game. I do. And it's a really pleasant, calm, fun game for all ages. It was created for especially the young ones, but I've seen it work as a, uh, a nice distraction for, like, honestly all ages literally uh and the game is called this panda needs you and the situation is you're you know you're helping this cute little panda who encounters these stacked block puzzles in a, a little bamboo forest and well the puzzles are fine when panda shows up uh well except a cloud comes along knocks everything all down because of you know the powerful wind and uh there they are the blocks are scattered everywhere and you need to put things back the way they should be. And things start out super easy. Um, the game flows where it's like just 10, 10 levels at a time. You The panda adventures out and, and you know needs your help to put things back right. And then after the 10th puzzle, panda goes back home and just, just is, that's all about a little purposeful pause, a nice break, and uh, a reminder that you, know, you don't have to keep playing. This isn't a casino. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is, uh, but, but you know what? By all means, you can adventure through over 50 levels and it's, it works on lots of different platforms for your you know uh, that we're, for wherever you are i imagine you're probably on either ios or android phone or tablet um, a mac uh, desktop or windows um, it's all over the place so you can uh ha it's i've updated the website this this panda.com there's links to all the places where you can buy it ah and if you are here because oh by the way if you did purchase the game already a great thing you could do is leave a review wherever you got it that helps more people find it and it's something you do for free and it's like a way of just like you know again it's like another little upvote if you get some value out of the show that's a really nice thing you can do but if you're here because you like the way we think about stuff and you don't really care so much about the stuff we make fair enough the show is the thing we make and we have more self-contained things that you can find at leanintoart.com slash workshops you can find a uh, self-contained video series uh, about various topics that we've talked about on the show at a price of your choosing, even free. You can get it for free. But if you get some value out of the thing, a really nice thing you could do is purchase it for a friend, then you're helping out a buddy, and then you're also giving us a tip for making something that you've got value out of. If you are watching the show on YouTube right now, you can give it a thumbs up. That helps more people find the show. If you listen to it in a podcatcher like Apple Podcasts, giving us a five-star review wherever you listen to the show, that helps more people find it is find us as well and we thank everybody who's doing exactly those things it means a lot to us it's i it's so funny it really does it, it means a lot and i think uh i keep thinking i should do a and like it's I, when people download our workshops for instance uh they almost are I mean, the forming, the, joining a little mailing list of folks that that I could reach out to again, and I think mm -hmm. um, I think that'd be neat. I, I really should do that. Um, I think both should. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, it's I don't mean to be half-hearted right now. It's it's like a it's like an unsolved puzzle. So yeah, I, it'd be fun to hear. It's like, what would you want to hear from someone? You know, saying like, hey, thanks, right? I mean, I I don't know. I probably would have a PDF of something laying around or. Um, I don't know, uh, what, yeah, that, that kind of email, like what would make it welcome instead of like, who's whatever, yeah, right, back, right. Get back in your podcast. Get out of my email. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Later podcast. But did I tell you that I, I held the door open for somebody today and they actually said, thank you, old man. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was like, that was, a, that was a barbed thank you. <laughs> no way. What? Nah. Okay. You need to be ready to go full Gandalf and you go answer me these questions three. Oh, you Pass think so? For, through my portal. And I is that, is that an within my rights? <laughs> I don't know. I guess yeah, I'm starting to look the part. Yes. <laughs> they'd be like, oh, did I miss out on an adventure? Uh, 
<laughs> uh, all right. Uh, it turns out we did get a final question thought posted in the chat. Did you see it, Rob? Yeah, I did. What do you I, think? Uh, I think it's interesting. I think um, let's uh, let's let's take a swing at it and okay, and see where so, it goes. Is it is it is it a final thought? You know, like question that's a rock, or do we crack it open? All of a sudden, more rocks fall out of it. I don't know. <laughs> let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Each one of those. There's more rocks than them. Oh no, oh, man! Recursive this is the nesting doll question. Ending. Yeah. Uh, do do? All right. So, longtime friend of the show, Troy Shadowing Tronics, is in there and says, "What takes more effort, the writing or the drawing? Which is most benefited by whittling, and which is hurt more?" Um, so, yes. Which? How does whittling change between the different stages of the process? Is what I'm hearing in that, right? And which ones are most benefited by whittling? Um, if I were to take a, a quick crack shot at it, I would say that oh, this is tricky. I was going to say writing benefits less from it. However, having done a web comic multiple times that took over, you know, a year and a half, two years, three years to produce, in the case of the Boulder and Fleet Mining for Trouble story I did, I was writing it as I went. Right? I didn't even know what the crisis, like the physical crisis of the story was going to be until well into the production of the comic. All I knew was they find a mine, these mineral gals are there, and they fight them. Uh, in my notebook, it literally just said, like, cool fight. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and I, I didn't know what the characters, like the, the villain's arc was going to be, or like Sapphire's emotional arc was going to be until way into the thing. So... That was a situation where I was whittling once a week. Once a week, I would sit down and put out another page. However, I will say that there were sessions where I thumbnailed 10 to 12 pages at a go. So there were sessions where it'd be like four hours of uninterrupted writing time on it. But those were spaced out over the course of a year and a half. Uh, did I, do I think the writing suffered as a result of that? I think the story has some padding in it. I think there's a couple pages where it's like, ooh, I was buying time <laughs> uh, to, to, get me, to get me to the next part. But um, so it's not as tight as it could have been. Uh, so I guess there's that. So if I, I guess I would stick to my original statement that probably writing, in my experience, suffers the most from whittling. Like I, I write better when I write in bigger marathons, but it's not impossible. What do you think, Rob? Well, I think, well, what is the final, um, final output? Because you can have a whole version of a story complete and then you can redo it. Or you could produce a sort of test portion of the story, which is, um, I mean, that's what I did with uh, Two Pizza Team this year. Just a little, uh, little eight-page story that... Um, sort of road tests the, you know, core character concepts and, and kind of conflict that they might run into and all that. Um, and let's see. The, yeah, like where do you pick up, end off? When do you say like this part's done and then what could have gone better? So I guess it depends on where the, where the markers are for the store. Like, are you done with this project and are, are walking away for a, from, for a significant period of time? Cause I guess if the, you know, the, the sort of whittling or iteration isn't done, that's something to think about. Um, Cause there always could be more iteration. And let's see. So for me, my writing is garbage when I first put it out of my head. Um, it's uh, it's better than um i don't know like i i literally uh, ideas fall out of my head in a really really rough form and it used to bug me i used to i used to, it, it just i i'd curse every word as i as i as i'd capture it down whether i needed to write something in, in any context, any like whether it was very a creative project, whether it was documentation for something I made, or like a, a blog post, 
to support or go along with a web comic or whatever, every bit of it. But um, I stopped caring about that because if I didn't, I would go nuts. And so I allowed the, um, I, I allowed it to suck and get out of my head. <laughs> and then, but that, but it doesn't stop because now I've practiced a lot, the, the sort of the, the reshaping and dialoguing with my own work. And so my, my writing benefits a lot from whittling, even in early stages. And, um, and so I, it, it's taught me to go back and forth and not worry about, is it coming out of my head in the, in the form of an outline? Um, am I writing the beginning or the end or the middle? Don't care. It's getting out of my head. And that's, that's helped me a ton to actually get more words out and practice uh, finishing things that, that I like better than I, than I did before. Mm. Uh, so, um, hmm. But then, interesting though, that uh, so uh, adding like a serialized rhythm for the output for a project, that's an interesting animal too. Like you mentioned, Jersey, like doing a webcomic. I see all sorts of weaknesses and crutches that I've used. Like if I, you look at uh, Art Geek Zoo, The Way of Sound, I have, you know, there's like four chapters of it that are finished and it's a, it's a finished enough chunk of a story, but totally could lead to more. Um, and uh, like in doing that, I've discovered like my biggest weakness for that type of story was um, I, I didn't, ha I did not add reactions. There's not enough reactions. And it just, so now uh, what do I do with that knowledge? Like, so was it hurt from, from whittling and iterating? Yes, but it also came into existence because of the whittling and iterating, you know, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a toughie. I, I, I don't know if it, if it even depends on what, what the nature of the project is, because I've also had situations where, you know, doing thumbnails uh, on a project, I only have time to do two pages of thumbnails today. Um, and while that's not my preferred scenario, it's like all I had and I did it and I shipped two pages. Um, I'd much rather do like a four to five hour chunk to like really get into it. Um, but then like I would come back the next day and look at what I did with that like hour that I had. And I was like, this is actually isn't bad, right? It's, it's, it's pretty okay. Just because I didn't get into that flow state that I crave so badly or whatever quotes, you know, mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean that the work isn't good. Um, so I can't say for sure that the writing necessarily suffers. Uh, I think, I think, uh, if you, okay, let me put it this way. I think I've been doing this long enough and in, 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 uh, in uh, consistently enough to where I, I think I know how to get myself into whatever mind space I need to to, to draw something. Like Mushin Girl was quoting, uh, 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 I think, a Fabulous Secret podcast I posted on my Patreon recently where um, I caught myself doing that the hesitation at the outset of thumbnailing a project where, like, you know, you, you get that resistance that Stephen Pressfield talks about where it's like, okay, this time it's not going to be any good. This is the time I find out I'm a fraud. You don't necessarily say it in those words, but like there's like a, a hesitation before embarking on something that you know is going to be a lot of effort. Um, partially because like it always looks better in your head and partially because, you know, uh, our, we're funny creatures and we like to engage with self-doubt and things like that. And then I noticed that like once I just thrown down those first initial lines on page one, the effort becomes gradually less and less. It like it starts to build up its own kind of momentum. And then once I've proven that I oh I've drawn four pages, I prove I can do that. Now I know I can do more. Um, where was I going with this? Oh, it's it's something about just like throwing the lines down on the paper just to get something going. Um, and I find that it, as long as the whittling session permits me to do a little bit of that, then some problems get solved. So I would say, at least in my experience. If I were to guess, it's probably a wash between penciling, inking, like the stages that I encounter. It may be different with uh, 
game design, right? Because those are very completely different disciplines when you're talking about like, oh, I'm going to play with music now. I'm going to play with animation. I'm going to play with, you know, actual algorithms. <laughs> or is it different? Uh, yeah, I mean, let's see. So what, let's see. So what, what's benefited and hurt by whittling and with, uh, with, with game, uh, game development? It's, hmm. I don't, I don't know if it's on a conceptual level, it's not that different. I, but I, okay. what I think is like how you engage with it. Um, mm, I think for me being, being able to be more under, I don't know. I don't know what this is going to sound like because it's uh it's almost like my whole rationalization for allowing a project to have a certain quality level, right? And and it's it's um, and what's I, I think I think everyone deals with this to some extent is is sort of how do you talk to yourself after you get the thing done, and and then you know. Uh, I think over time through practice, I, I think the practice led to be being me being more um, honest, honestly more compassionate with myself and that whatever I have as far as a capacity to deal with the thing, to do less beating up of myself about the capacity to do the thing and to be less attached to perfectionism related to the thing. And that has benefited me in anything I try to make in with any hat I try to wear with what I try to make. So that makes it easier to sort of, you know, fire up that engine of like for this project, I really need to embrace these constraints and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah this is where i'm I reminded I'm, I'm reminded of a quote i forget who this is attributed to um it might be fabian messienza of, of marvel comics but whoever it was they said uh you know when it comes to comics pages you get one panel to show off and the rest of them are journeyman panels right mm -hmm. and the, the the reframing that i like about that is that not every piece of the thing you're making is intended to dazzle right and we can we can bewilder ourselves with that with it, trying to achieve that and there are there are some parts of the thing that you make are just there to to like just serve a function just to like communicate communicate an idea simply uh or just provide like a reaction some padding a moment of quiet whatever it is right um so shadowing followed up with another question you know could it be a case of over whittling or under whittling and knowing when when and when not to stop uh, i think that's i think i would take that and i would run with it and say it's also knowing uh when it's time to like are you catching yourself trying to whittle to the point of dazzling somebody and and i think the whole point of whittling is just putting in like purposeful bursts of effort to move forward on a thing um and one of the th it, this goes back to embracing constraints that Rob was talking about. One thing I like about that is it helps. It's like a, a regular reminder that it's not always about dazzling, right? And mm. it's, sometimes it's just about shipping. Well, and then in the, in acknowledging your own quirks and your experience, and then the audience you're trying to serve. And this is the sort of argument for framing things as a like a, a creative project as a service minded thing having that intention of uh and it's always something you can go back to of like well does this dazzling moment serve the intention of, of, of the project and does it fit with my capacity and my experience and yeah then you can sort of do a matchmaking thought experiment on it and say okay this fits this doesn't fit and it's less about like well Am I, you know, it's some kind of uh, harsh self judgment thing of like, well, I've gained, I've built the skill, therefore I must execute at this level all the time to do. And it's like, it's, it's not a productive loop to get involved in. I don't think. Agreed. Absolutely agreed. Uh, if you look at Mining for Trouble and you look at a friendly game, both Boulder and Fleet stories, both at boulderandfleet.com, very different production values on those two projects based on the way I was making the project.
a friendly game. I was shipping a page a day during October. Uh, Mining for Trouble, I shipped a page a week over the course of a year and a half, right? It, it produced completely different products. Mm. Uh, and I'm but okay then, with that. And it's okay. That's that's huge. That is, and and that that really rounds it out. And and the I'm I'm okay with that. And so like if you're overwhelmed, overwhittling, underwhittling, it's that's your that's a fitness thing to work out for you and your project. Um, and I know I've you know, I've landed on these ideas from this in in that we've covered in this very uh, podcast because of just not feeling a good match and feeling you know frustrated or, or challenged by what were how a project went and uh but that's where again doing some uh journaling and reflection and seeing this change over time like as you develop with your own work uh this is you know this is where you end up with a uh, i don't know a series of things to unbox and share um, on a podcast, for instance, for seven <laughs> years now. Yes. Happy anniversary. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> all right. Well, I think we did a podcast. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, all right. Well, we do this show. Thank you to Mushin Girl and Shadow Electronics for you know providing all the thought thoughtful interaction in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. And uh, we record the show weekly, Thursdays, 10 p.m. Eastern Time, 9 p.m. Central. We stream it live on YouTube and then collect it as a podcast at patreon.com slash leanintoart and leanintoart.com. You can find us on all the different, you know, you can find us on Stitcher and then Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Um, yeah, subscribe to us uh, any way that you want to. And we'll be back with another show next week. Until then, I have been Jersey Drozd of leanintoart.com. And Jersey Droz on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of leanintoart.com and Rob Stenzinger on the gram. Okay. Bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening. All right, I'm going to shut off the stream. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out. Oh. Yep, thanks for hanging out.